Wow. Except oh, there you are. Lots of tags. How are y'all? Hello. Hello, Randall. How are you? <laughs> we just closed out of one meeting and saw half of these people there, and uh, uh, the magic of the magic of the medium. Um, let's see. So it's been an interesting day in New York, or the, uh, last night, this weekend, with another kind of a. I just it pains me so much with this. Um, 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 a, um, Asian American Pacific Island oh, conflict. Yeah. It's horrible. It's horrible. Um, uh, but um, hey, Jim, how are you? Good to see you. Good to see you. And, Hope everyone's well. All right. Um, and and I, nice to meet you virtually, <laughs> Ariel. Thank we, you. We've corresponded a few times, but uh, now I get to meet you face to face. Right. Right. The magic of Zoom. <laughs> I know. This would have been an expensive trip. Uh, <laughs> will we ever get to travel again? That's my question. Oh uh, yeah. I do see that we have uh, uh, our friends from across the across uh, the ocean, uh, Christian and uh, from uh, I believe from Denmark and Monica from uh, um, Austria or Germany. I cannot quite remember. Uh, how are you, Monica? Good to see you again. You may know some of these. These folks and Christian, they're both uh, uh, colleagues in the area of the nighttime economy. And uh, uh, Brian King, nice to see you. Thank you, man, for uh, the, 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 bicycle, the bicycling lawyers with us. And, and there's my little buddy. Hey, man. <laughs> He's getting shy again. He does that. Okay. Um, we also have Jose Sogard. Oh, cool. From your, from your team. Yes. He's uh, my deputy. There he is. Hey, Jose. <laughs> nice to meet you. Thanks for thank you for helping get us at, uh, make this happen. Uh, we may have some other people joining in. Um, I am aware that um, um, a good number of uh, of our friends from the city of Dallas um, will be joining us. The senior executive team. Uh, and uh, the word I got was um, um, that an assistant city um, manager. So one of the top executives, our police chief, uh, two folks from the uh, city attorney's office, an assistant police chief, and um, um, also the gentleman who's in charge of code enforcement. Great. <laughs> will be joining us. There's a great deal of interest right now from the city of Dallas in the nighttime economy and the nightmare movement. Uh, I had a very wonderful conversation just now uh, before a board meeting with the head of Office of Economic Development. Uh, they're going to commit to paying for um, economic impact study of That's the perfect. economy. So, and they're incorporating that finally for the first time in their economic plan. So as many people are joining us, I'm so excited to see so many friends. Uh, um, so many people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, um, so here's, well, I'll just get started, Ariel. Um, um, it's 7.01, you're so prompt. I know, well, you know, for, for a Texan, I might normally be slow, but uh, um, I'll get going here. Um, thank you all for joining us for this first member meeting of 24 Hour Dallas of the year. Um, uh, we believe that uh, the future of Dallas at night is important to the future of Dallas. Um, arts and culture, public spaces at night, safety, racial equity, economic vibrancy, all kind of make international cities more attractive to residents, visitors, and businesses. So how does New York City manage its impressive nighttime economy and what can Dallas learn from its nightlife mayor? Uh, you'll hear the term nightmare, nightmare, uh, nightlife mayor, nighttime manager. Um, uh, it's a term that's thrown around a lot. Uh, it's, uh, uh, I'll let Arielle tell you a little bit about really what her title means and what the responsibility is of her role. But different uh, cities have this, uh, uh, are beginning to establish a person whose job it is to do this. Today, 24 Hour Dallas, uh, during this meeting, we're going to explore this topic with uh, Arielle Pallets, uh, who is the Senior Executive Director of the Office of Nightlife at the Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment in New York City. Um, um, thank you all for being members of 24 Hour Dallas. My name is Randall White. I am the founder and president of the board of this all volunteer nonprofit organization. We have several of our board members here with us today too, and some committee members. Today, we're gonna to talk about what is this global trend about nighttime economies? What's that all about? 
Uh, what makes for a 24 hour city? We call ourselves 24 hour Dallas. I've had people in the commercial real estate world go, well, yeah, maybe 18 hour Dallas. Uh, how important is the nighttime economy to a city? Uh, how even in the face of a global pandemic, does a city's nighttime economy rebound? And what is the story of New York City since it began focusing on its nightlife in an official way um, uh, three years ago? Uh, just briefly, I want to tell some of you about the background of 24 Hour Dallas. It started uh, about five years ago um, uh, when I was still uh, being a consultant and a, a public policy advocate. I had a, a client, the Restaurant Association in Dallas was approached by several bars because they were getting wind of a, um, of a problem coming out of Dallas City Hall where um, ordinances would be established that would be uh, prohibitive of uh, business and nighttime operations, mostly due to residential and business district conflict. And so we were called in to help resolve that. In the process of, uh, of doing that, um, uh, we connected with the uh, uh, nighttime uh, economy network around the world. Um, I got the chance to interact and meet with the, some of the night mayors and the leaders in this uh, industry. And that evolved into this nonprofit organization, 24 Hour Dallas. And uh, we have areas of we're focusing on uh, public places at night, nighttime placemaking, as we call it, arts and culture, safety, racial equity, economic vibrancy. These are all areas of our focus. And uh, um, uh, we have many of you are involved in some of our teams on this. Uh, a little quick assessment of who is on this phone call. We have, um, uh, uh, I see city leaders, I see board members, I see people from various industries. Um, uh, I see people from around the world, Ariel, uh, who are here on the call. I see safety experts, I see money experts, I see city planning experts, I see uh, folks involved with our um, major cultural venues and some major nonprofit organizations, cultural nonprofits are on the call with us. Uh, our format of this meeting will be, uh, we'll start with uh, an introduction of Ariel and, uh, and then move from there. Um, with some questions I'll ask her. And then uh, I like to kind of triage any kind of questions that come up out of the group. Um, uh, and, and, and then we'll let, uh, um, we'll wrap up in that way. I have some announcements of some things coming up that members might be interested in. Uh, so Ariel, um, I read her bio today. I'm not a big fan of just kind of repeating bios, but I will tell you that she's a lifetime New Yorker. She came up through the hospitality industry. She actually ran um, a bar for a while in New York City, but then began getting involved um, in an advocacy perspective to help entrepreneurs uh, uh, start up um, uh, nighttime businesses. And about um, mm, four years ago, I guess, um, uh, some of the city leaders in New York City, if this is correct, kind of picked up that we needed a point person. We needed a, night, a nighttime office in New York City and approached Mayor Bill de Blasio. And he signed off on that, established this nighttime office uh, uh, within his operation that looks at entertainment and everything for New York City and appointed Ariel as the first nighttime um, mayor, if you will, of, of any major city in the United States. We subsequently have had other individuals appointed in uh, the Washington DC and Detroit, Orlando. Uh, Dallas is not quite near, that, near there yet. But there's one in Austin. There's one in Austin, that's true. So uh, there's an entire network of folks that are focused on the nighttime economy. And uh, so uh, Ariel, thank you so much for joining us. Excited to have you. Always nice to talk to a New Yorker. And uh, uh, we're glad you're here. I'm going to ask you some questions, and then we'll just kind of go from there, if that's all right with you. And uh, uh, I hope everyone hears and learns and maybe thinks about how we can apply what we're hearing uh, from the New York City experience to Dallas or Monica and Christian, wherever you are, and the research you're doing. So, um, Ariel, it's really apparent that a, a place like New York City, a place like London, a place like Berlin benefits from having somebody who's a nighttime mayor. Uh, but why should a, a next tier city, if I can use that term, like Dallas or Denver or Minneapolis, consider having someone who manages what happens in a city after 6 p.m. and before 6 a.m.? You mean the other nine to five? The other half of the day. 
Yes. <laughs> why, well, why, why? Um, I mean, for the first year, I think I feel, well, first of all, let me first say thank you, Randall, for your enthusiasm and your drive and for bringing me here and all of these people. I'm elated to be here. And um, it's really exciting to be able to share what New York is doing with other cities and to help convey what we've accomplished and what we're doing and building um, and to hopefully inspire other cities to do the same. So let me start there. Um, and um, thank you for the introduction. To answer your question, for like the first year um, that I had this position, I really was mostly answering the question, why do we need an office of nightlife, even in New York City? And um, really the answer is, you know, why haven't we always had one? Why isn't um, the nighttime economy, why hasn't it always been seen as a priority? We know historically life at night, uh, nightlife has not always been seen as an asset per se, right? In many ways as a liability. It hasn't been seen as an economic engine, a creator of jobs and tax revenue and culture. Um, but to your point, there has been a global movement, really. Uh, there's over 50 nightlife offices around the world now. And in a way, New York was late to the party, um, I like to say. Um, life is not a daytime activity. We all live in the day and the night. Life is 24 hours, regardless of what you do and who you are. It's an essential part of an economy of a city. There's the taxi drivers, the pizza plate parlors, the clothing stores that, um, you know, people buy clothes to go out at night. It is an ecosystem. You can't have the day without the night or the night without the day. The idea of separating them is nearly nonsensical. So it's about decriminalizing life at night. Mm -hmm. It's really about embracing, appreciating, respecting what it contributes. And I think this pandemic um, has actually very successfully illustrated what a life would look like without life at night. And so I think as part of the global movement um, and now within this pandemic, it is clear it is essential to everything we are as a society, not only culturally, locally, but globally, economically. And um, this office has been created to help illustrate that as we're building it. Well, speaking of that, then, then no doubt as the executive of the New York City's Office of Nightlife, you've never had a typical week. But if you must describe one, what does your work week look like? What is, what, uh, you're accountable to a commission? Tell, tell us what you know, a typical work week's like. Well, we are in with we are within the mayor's office, right? Uh, it's a day job, which a lot of people don't understand. They're like, "So do you go out every night?" Um, and uh, I say, "Not you know, not as much as I used to, but I <laughs> do." <need to. laughs> but it's a day job, and uh, I have surprisingly for the task at hand, it's me plus three. You have see so Jose Sogard, my deputy director there, the wind beneath my policy wings. <laughs> and um, I have, you know, two other people. We are within an agency. Um, this job is really first and foremost because we're creating something from scratch. It was really about identifying the systemic problems, the macro problems, but also helping people on a micro level every single day, navigating them through bureaucracy. We're a non-enforcement office. We are a convener and um, we are on the phone a lot, um, but we're also um, envisioning, reaching out, um, receiving information. Um, I guess the best way to say it is, you know, as we've been 
developing this office and assessing what the top priorities were really in the first year, um, we had to deduce. I mean, this is a huge uh, undertaking. How do you, you know, where do you start? And so we really had to start defining our priorities, which were to help small businesses, which is really what they are, navigating through bureaucracy, helping to support the culture as well, right? The underground movements and the DIYs and helping to legitimize their existence and decriminalize their existence. We have to um, address the issues around harm reduction, safety, fairness, equity, um, the issues that we know are the day-to-day -day, uh, problems and issues that people within the nightlife community deal with. And also to your earlier point, uh, take quality of life under serious assessment, right? Because most enforcement happens because of complaint, all, almost all enforcement is complaint driven. And it usually comes from one person living upstairs and you've got you know, millions of dollars and thousands and hundreds of jobs. So assessing the priorities, reaching out to the community, finding out the solutions from them, amplifying their voice, their ideas, and taking this office and making sure that they and this industry has a seat at the table every day. Fantastic. Now, I recently saw some promotion or some program that your office was initiating that was mitigating conflict, which I, I thought this is exactly where we started. Uh, the whole 24-hour Dallas thing started with a conflict between residents and businesses. Yeah. Now, tell, tell me a little, I, I, didn't, I didn't tell you I was going to ask you this, but tell me a little bit about that that particular program or other programs, outreach kinds of things that your office is doing or? Well, what I didn't mention, which you touched upon is, um, I was a club owner for 10 years in the East Village, um, 250 capacity, two floor, two bars, two dance floors, old school hip hop, reggae Latin eighties and rock and roll underground <laughs> driven dance club. It's <laughs> a great description. <laughs> in a residential neighborhood, in a residential building. So I was literally the number one most complained about bar in New York for <laughs> a long time uh, because of one person. And it's actually what politicized me, activated me. It's actually what led me to this position. So as it led you to your fruition, as it did to me. And so um, one of the first things that I did when I embarked on this was to invite um, the New York Peace Institute, which is a state funded free mediation program for all types of conflicts. I um, to the table to our five borough listening tour that we did um, in which I actually invited the state liquor authority, police, fire, health, all the city agents and state agencies with me on stage to listen. And I invited them to have a table. The only table was the Peace Institute. Um, and it was because, like I said, and like you said, this is the crux of the problem. It's, it, it creates the enforcement. So I took my personal experience and I also sat on my local community board while I owned a bar for seven years on the liquor licensing committee, listening to the complaints and how organized and militant it could be even. And um, I was like, there's gotta be a better way. There has, there is a void between complaint and enforcement, right? It's become automated, it's become anonymous. I make a joke like back in the day, you would go down, if you had a complaint with the bar downstairs, you would go down with a bat and come up with a bottle of wine, right? Those days are kind of over, right? Now you call 311 and it's anonymous and there's this protection and emboldens people. So to make a short story long, I um, came up with this, sorry, that's my mom. Um, <laughs> I came up with this idea, um, where we would provide free mediation for 
complainants who may very well have a valid complaint and their, their business neighbor to sit through direct um, communication and compromise with trained impartial mediators, not the community board, not the local police department, although they are partners with us in this endeavor to establish a relationship, to exchange phone numbers, to put each other in each other's shoes, because the implication that you could just say, turn it down, call the cops and it's never gonna happen again is a fantasy, right? This is a long-term relationship. It's gonna get loud, it's gonna get wild, it's gonna go down, it's gonna go up. You need to have direct communication. You need to have mutual respect and trust and acknowledgement that you each have the right to be there and um, not to um, project the worst on each other. And that's why we created MEND, which is Mediating Establishment Neighborhood Disputes, NYC. And it's only been about three or four months now and it's been embraced. Well, I saw, I saw the word of that, I thought that's brilliant. I thought that's brilliant because uh, oftentimes, and I'm sure any of our city folks that are on this call know it's difficult to kind of slice across um, those kind of entrenched um, uh, constituencies and mediate, mediate what a wonderful role for that office to do. Tell me, we, what are, tell us a little bit about the nighttime economy of New York City. It's, it's economic value, it's workforce, um, I know from your financial, from your economic impact study that was done a couple of years ago, we have it parked on our website. There are some numbers there, but speak to us a little bit about what constitutes the nighttime economy of New York City, and what is what are some what's some data points on that? Well, I mean, to your point, we did do this economic impact study. It was one of the first things we did within a few months. It was essential to be able to demonstrate what the economy of life at night is um, because for some people, culture isn't that important, right? right? <laughs> you could talk all about the grassroots and the incubators and the safe havens, but some people just don't care. They care if it's legal, if it's safe, and what does it do for me? <laughs> so having that economic impact to show, at least in New York, pre-pandemic, it was a $35.1 billion industry of economic output. Now that includes ancillary, right? Every, again, this is an ecosystem. This isn't an A to B conversation. Everything and everyone depends on it, whether they like it or know it. And it also supported 700, uh, 700 no, 300,000 jobs. We've lost over 140,000 of those in the pandemic so mm -hmm. far with innumerable amounts of business closures at the moment. 700 million in tax revenue. I mean, think about all of the basic city needs that that helps to fund. Yeah, um, yeah sometimes I think uh, Dallas, Dallas is still in this kind of nine to five mindset. And we talk a lot with our arch, arch and cultural friends which who are on this call, that they're not necessarily seen as part of the uh, uh, financial economic e ecosystem of the city of Dallas, when in fact, these are you know, it's not, it's not just the people you see on stage, it's the entire fanned out, uh, you know, the people in the office, the promoters, the stagehands. There are so many people involved. And we're about to get that kind of data in Dallas. I'm so excited. I'm so excited Dallas. for you. It's also the manicurists and the shoe stores and the taxi drivers and the pizza places and the hairstylists. I mean, it's about dating and, 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 everything celebrating and mourning, like everybody has that in their lives. And it's just absolutely essential. And actually at this point, it's unavoidable, right? right? It's either you're gonna get it and get on board with the fact that the nighttime is its own economy or you, you don't understand the new world order. <laughs> what, what um, in what ways do you feel like New York City has mastered, even in spite of the pandemic, pandemic or maybe pre-pandemic, since your office was created, since you were put in place, in what ways do you feel like that New York City has become more nighttime friendly or stronger at, at, at addressing the night? What's, what's your biggest success? Tell me. 
I mean, I honestly think just the, just the creation of the Office of Nightlife in and of itself was a signal to the industry who had felt so criminalized and as a second class and unrespected and unsupported, the idea that the, the city government would say, you have, you provide enough for this city to have a dedicated office to represent you, a non-enforcement entity as a liaison to make sure you have all of the information, all of the regulations, all of the support that you need, and to help be your voice to amplify you from within. That was enough to start. It was a shock. Nobody would expect it. From that point, they appointed me, right? A night lifer. It could have been a political appointee. It could have been somebody in enforcement. It could have been somebody from the state liquor authority, but they, they appointed somebody, one of their own, right? So that was another layer of trust. And the entire process is a layer of trust, mm. layering upon layering, being there for them, delivering for them, convening th for them. Throughout this pandemic, we've done over 10 live Zooms with multi-agency, including police and the Department of Buildings, Department of Health, Department of Transportation, helping them all understand the regulations. Also for the workers, making sure they know what their resources are for mental health, medical insurance, despite you know, your immigration status and ability to pay, where you can get food. Some people throughout this pandemic haven't, in their, for their first time, need food stamps for the first time in their lives. So it's just being dedicated to them and them knowing that. And you're able, it sounds like you're able to kind of slice across many city departments and then pull in outside agencies like the Liquor Authority and other nonprofits. Is that the weight of this office? Is that is that the mayor saying, this is important, I'm placing this office, this person, this position. So you respond to this, you're a convener across these silos, right? Yes. I mean, when I said the mayor's office of nightlife is calling, mm -hmm. people pick up. It has weight. And it it's not just from within the, and even like, let's say my relationship with the police department or the health department, that's also building trust within them as well, right? When I go to one police plaza and meet with the chief of police, um, or the deputy chief of police. I know him because 10 years ago, he was my commanding officer when that woman was calling on me on a regular basis. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they know that I've been there as well. Um, not that that's a necessary pre -re prerequisite, but it helps, right? And it's also about outside of the administration. Organizations such as yours, um, so many have have sprung up through this pandemic, right? The power of organizing, I think, is one of the greatest benefits of what we've reaped from this horrible experience. We have not only the Nightlife Association, we have NIVA, which is the National Independent Venue Association, which helped pass the Save Our Stages F, you know, SVOG grant. A, a, an activist organization of venues, right? So we are also a convener and a bridge for them. They gather the message, they create, they be able, they're able to speak with one voice and then I can amplify. The greatest power of this office is the phrase, what I'm hearing is. Mm. Mm. How different is your office from other nighttime offices. I mean, like uh, the Washington DC, Sean, I, he and I have talked, uh, the, the young woman in Orlando, uh, the gentleman in Detroit, how are they all, how is the New York City office different or managed differently? Do you know? Um, not all of them are within the mayor's office. Some of them are outside. Some of them, it's just them alone, which I can't even imagine. Also, they're much smaller. Obviously, we're dealing with 8 million people, 60 right. million tourists pre-pandemic, BC, before COVID. Um, so 
and I'm sorry, it's getting dark in here. I hope you can still see me. Um, <clears throat> oddly enough, and I'm in touch also with um, the different nightlife offices around the world. Wow. We've been on calls with Mumbai and Berlin and Amsterdam. We're surprisingly alike, right? These are universal problems. The problem of having an annoying neighbor or a, a loud bar underneath you is universal. Mm. Having a problem with the police and not being able to understand uh, developing a new relationship or over enforcement or inequities. These are universal human experiences, regardless of where you go. And that's why it's a global movement. You know, we might have more support, we might have more money, I might have bigger staff, I might have a smaller staff, but at the end of the day, we're pretty much the same. So, so as the first nighttime executive of a, an American United States city in the United States, what what is your, what would you say is your mm, f floor for a, a, a city, an other city in, in the United States to want to approach a 24 hour mindset of nighttime mayor? What boxes does a city need to check in order to say, hey, we're ready, we can go, we need to focus on this. Is there a, is there a base, a base, or is that all cities need to be looking at their nighttime economies? I mean, all cities, you know, I mean, I think it has to have a acknowledgement of life at night, right? I mean, so a city like Orlando, for example, or I think in Pittsburgh, and I just want to correct you, I'm not, we're not the first. We were the biggest. Okay. Pittsburgh was before us. Um, Iowa City? <laughs> yes. I don't think he was before us, actually. Uh, that was after. That was after. <laughs> DC was after us. We were the biggest. Spot. Okay. Okay. But not the first. Okay. Um, New York wanted to see things happen around. I mean, if Iowa City, um, if Iowa City ha needs a nightlife office, so does everyone. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? I do. I mean, but the, my point is that it's also like different ways of looking at life at night. Mine is strictly devoted to entertainment and liquor licensing, bars, clubs, restaurants, live music venues, performance venues. But some of them expanded further, like in London, for example, they have a nightlife czar. Yeah. And she's terrific. Um, which I feel like I was gypped out of that really cool title, but um, who doesn't want to be a czar? Um, but she deals with life at night in its most actual definition. Um, nurses, doctors, bus drivers, transportation, you know, this is a whole world. And there are people who live and work at night in every city. There is not, not, not one city or town anywhere in the world where everything shuts down. And if there is, I don't want to go there. Right, right. <laughs> uh, Amy, Amy LeMay is a, a fantastic personality and very strong force as the night czar for uh, uh, London. And their economic impact studies also posted on our website. I was surprised to see uh, uh, the their embrace of the healthcare industry because of the workforce. And one of the things we talked about here was the people who work at night do not have access to the same kind of services as the people who work by day. People who work at night many times have to take a day off to vote. Where do they register? Where do they get their haircut? Where, where do they get the basic services that the other folks, oh, that's nice, a little, it's all right. It's, it's New York City, it's lovely. So, um, as Woo, yeah, disco. there you go. There you go. Kind of a club scene, club vibe. Now, do you? Uh, <laughs> okay. I'm going to try and make it better. Okay. So. Do you understand? You mentioned earlier about racial economic justice. Tell yeah. me about the connections between a city, and I'm really intrigued by that. You talked about the, the how your office is helping New York City become more just and more uh, racially um, equitable. Talk about that a little bit. Um, listen, it's complicated, right? We've seen with the emergence of Black Lives Matter, the 
spotlight shining on bias mm -hmm. and social injustice mm -hmm. and systemic racism. And even when I have conversations with the highest ranks of the police department, the answer is we can always do better. We have to do better. We should do better. We will do better, right? It's not a point of defensiveness. It can't be a point of defensiveness. It has to be an acceptance that we need to do better, not just on a police level, but just at the door, at a nightclub, right? Racist do door policies, booking policies, hiring policies. We've had round tables on race with promoters and um, owners and are working on developing best practices that are universally accepted, much like we are around the issues around consent and sexual permission mm. in these sexually charged spaces. Just because you're in a nightclub doesn't give somebody the right to grab you or touch your hair, right? We have to, we are evolving into a more conscious, more, um, more fair-minded, um, safer, more cautious perhaps society. And we must evolve with it, but do it um, in a intelligent and thoughtful and strategic way um, with purpose. And the nighttime industries can lead on that. And okay. should. And should. And, and should. I mean, again, this is about reframing nightlife, right? This is about taking it from the idea that nightlife is a liability to an opportunity where people can look out for each other, not where people get hurt, right? We work on bystander training, right? For not only um, the employers for their employees, but for bartenders and waiters to be able to identify um, someone who's suicidal, someone who might be having an episode with fentanyl, right? How do you look at the use of drugs in a, in a venue, not as a crime, mm -hmm. right? that needs to be prosecuted, but as someone who needs help. Right, right. Uh, the, the woman, Kate, in Seattle talks about how some of the clubs in Seattle created uh, um, survival kits for when people were having um, unfortunate yeah. drug episodes. And they got some uh, pushback because it seemed like they were somehow or another mm, endorsing drug use when what they were trying to do is to say, there are, there's going to be drugs, but we're gonna be ready to save somebody's lives. Aha, uh -huh. I did it. Oh, so, there you go. Right. I was in my, my mood mode and I was in <laughs> mode on my light bulb. Okay. That's so there's an opportunity there to rethink how we're interacting with this kind of um, um, bias and injustice. And that truly, right. I think in a way, the nighttime industries can take the lead on that in ways that our banks and our uh, commercial real estate businesses maybe cannot, right? because we can think out of the box? We have to. Right. This is reality, right? And what we also know is the war on drugs is over, right? Even today, New York State decriminalized and legalized marijuana. Right. Round of applause for New York State, <laughs> right? The war on drugs is over because it failed, right? And we also now know that which it was also a race issue, if we're being honest, mm -hmm. right? Which was part of the, the uh, motivation to finally pass this law was because of the inequities against black and brown, beautiful young kids getting incarcerated for their whole freaking lives, right? But a white kid can have a bag of whatever and be off and free, right? But now it's everybody's kids. We know it's everybody's kids. It's everybody's brother. It's everybody's uncle. This is a family society problem. Are we going to criminalize everybody? No, we need to help people. And again, nightlife is an opportunity where we can help people, right? It's not a place to, to criminalize. In New York, the New York City Department of Health 
now has a standing prescription for Narcan mm. at different pharmacies around the city where you can go and get your own Narcan, which is the nasal spray to bring someone back right. from a fentanyl overdose. You think you're taking cocaine, which is an upper, and you take a huge dose of fentanyl and you die your first time. And that's happening, I guess, all over the country. So we have to decriminalize human behavior. Mm. 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 And I think we're able to do that. I mean, even through, just look at the plastic straw ban, right? right. That with nightclubs, that is also nightlife leading the way for social consciousness, environmental consciousness. That's very nice. And I also like it, Demetrius Mastoris, um, the gym, uh, talks about bystander training. And you mentioned that and the, um, uh, that there's a role that we all can have in those situations when we see something, somebody in, in a dire, dire need. And that's a, actually something I think our safety team is talking about a little bit about how we can incorporate and advocate for that. I also saw one of our uh, members, our advisory council members, when you started talking about the um, 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 inequities in punishing people, uh, a white kid with a bag of, of, of weed and a black kid with a bag of weed, she posted preach, you know, so, so she, she, Jasmine got it. Tell me, um, what piece of advice more than any other, Ariel, would you give to uh, a city just beginning to focus on their nighttime economies or embracing this kind of 24-hour mindset? What's the first most important piece of advice you'd give another city? I mean, I think it's about, you know, really respecting the industry. You have to start with respect and appreciation and recognition for what, for all of the things that it contributes. Um, and when you start from that perspective, you start to think about solutions and how to make it better, how to make it stronger, how to make it work. If, if you look at it like it's a problem, then it's, your, it's a nail that needs a hammer. And that has been the historic perspective mm. on nightlife and people at night. Again, it comes down to marginalized communities, the LGBTQ community, the Black community, which is why we had the antiquated um, uh, cabaret law, right. which was a repealed at the same time as the creation of my office. Right. This, this was a law that suppressed oppressed dancing because it was the underground um, oppressed black and gay communities that were created actually the greatest nightlife in the world <laughs> <laughs> in New York and everywhere else. We have them to thank for the great nightlife that we have. Um, but it was, it was because it was illegal to be gay in public. Right, 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 right. So this is all residual of historic bias. And it's part of also in the, uh, the, the whole um, uh, lockout laws in, in the Sydney were also based on, on trying to tamp down late night dancing. Dallas has a very odd dance hall ordinance thing as well that seems to be residual of, of yes. another time in the past. So, we are breaking free of that, but it has to be a conscious choice. Gotcha. It has to be progressive. Gotcha. It has to be a come to Jesus. Gotcha. So to speak. <laughs> <laughs> we understand that down here in Texas. So. <laughs> it's probably inappropriate, but it's the only thing I can, you know. <laughs> think about. Gotcha. We're good. We're good. <laughs> Uh, my last question of you, and then we'll take some questions. I see a few popping up in chat. If anybody else wants to issue a question of Ariel, uh, pop it in the chat, and we'll, we'll ask, answer as many as we can. My last question of you is, what is, in your tenure, in your tenure as the nightlife mayor of New York City, what's been the most, satisfac most satisfying memory for you? Memory? Mm-hmm. <sighs> Um, memory, gosh. Well, getting appointed was a good one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Seeing the I whole mean, thing form was a good one, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, every day we're creating this from scratch. You know, I really do just love waking up every single day. I love this job. I love this opportunity. I'm so grateful for it. Every day, I mean, is epic. Like, Jose and I are like high fiving each other at the end of every day. Like, I can't believe that just happened today. <laughs> like, it's just, we're, you're, you're, you're breaking the ground as you're walking on it. And um, I just think it's, you know, a blur, to be honest, <laughs> which is why I probably can't think of one. Okay. Okay. I get it. Well, so let me ask, there's some questions here. I'll think, of, I'll, I'll, okay. I'll... Well, you can bring it up. Here's one question. Uh, uh, how do you ensure that the police and enforcement agencies um, engage in a way that supports the city's mission and goals of advocacy and economic viability? Oh my gosh, uh, this sounds like a thesis question. So working with police and enforcement agencies in a way that can advocate economic vibrancy, mm -hmm. how, do, how, do you, how do you ensure that? Again, I think we, first of all, before the pandemic, um, again, when we first created this office, we started with the premise that we needed to have a interagency approach, a MASH approach is the way we call it, multi-agency support for hospitality. We brought from day one, the state liquor authority, the head of the police, fire, health, all the city agencies, not just enforcement, to sit, not just figuratively, literally at the same table, Every six weeks, we have a dedicated interagency working group. And we sit, before, before the pandemic, we would have 25, 30 people in a room crammed in, wanting to fix this, self-regulate, revise, self-correct, right? These are the same problems that the, the police, and that everyone's been dealing with over and over and over and over and over for years, right? I think once this office was created, there was a center point of contact to say, now what? Now what are the, the problems and what are the solutions? When I meet with the police regularly, we have very honest conversations, right? But I'll, I'll just say that now, in this pandemic, right, the attitude has changed also, has improved even more so. Again, the police in New York, in my experience, at least at the top brass level, have always been, we can do better, we're great, grateful that you're here, let's figure it out. When I came up with MEND, they were elated because even all the electeds, elated. How many complaints can you get from the same person and have no solution, mm. right? It's a relief to have somebody thinking about solving these problems. Yeah. Um, but the pandemic, I think, has, again, it showed us a world without bars, without restaurants, without clubs. It was the worst case scenario personified. Nice. And now you see police saying, listen, we know what they've been through. We don't want to break backs. We want to help them because what will they have to police? Right, right, right. What's there? What's there if, if we're we not don't there? bring them back? Right. Someone asked, um, uh, Dallas is a very data-driven kind of decision-making thing in our evaluations of taking on new projects or ideas. Do you, we know you have your initial economic impact study, but what other data do you have metrics to show we went from here to here? Well, um, we are actually coming out with a nightlife report that was actually legislatively mandated to us when with the creation of this office. It's actually about a year late due to the pandemic and is to um, be released imminently, actually. Um, it has a lot of the story of what we've done for the last three years and also recommendations on how to stabilize the, the industry moving forward. And it also has some metrics as okay. well, which I know are extremely important. Mm -hmm. um, Again, this office is also being created from scratch with 
me plus three people, people are like, well, how many people do you talk to every single day? And how many cases have you solved? It's, we do have a database that does follow all of those cases on a case per case basis and that data. But um, I'm sure as this office develops further, there will be even stronger ways of measuring. Okay, and uh, I see, I do see a couple of our friends from the new members uh, from the uh, uh, city of Dallas and uh, from uh, the Dallas Police Department are on this call and listening and very appreciative of that. Uh, your MEND program that you talked about that the police force in New York City is very pleased with. Um, yes. If anybody is, uh, if anybody from the city is interested in hearing more about that, I'll get that information from you and share it with them. Yes. Um, uh, Actually, I think it's worth noting that the same New York Peace Institute mediation certification program that I went through, the entire um, NCO neighborhood community um, officers went through. Every single NCO officer in New York has been through mediation training. It is actually part of their neighborhood policing approach okay. that was developed years ago. I just think it'd be a lot of relief. And I see that assistant city manager, John Fortune, just sent me a message going, yes, please send more information on men. So we'll get that you're, you're for you. You're welcome to call me directly. Okay. I'd be okay. happy to talk to you about it in uh, detail. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, connect, I'll connect you directly too, John, with uh, 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 Ariel. Uh, here's another question, a very interesting question. Given the luxury of hindsight, yeah. what would you have done differently? so far in your term? Um, <laughs> I mean, I think so far so good. I think maybe, you know, we, we tried very early on to set the database and infrastructure early as we could. And, you know, I wish we had more, more staff Honestly, I mean, it's not something that is really in my hands. This office was really developed and seen as an experiment, right? Like, what's the office of nightlife? Like, let's give it a teeny budget and just a couple of people and see what happens. But, you know, we know what the weight of this and the bandwidth of this, and it's not really enough. And so we really are, you know, stretched. And um, I wish, not that I per se, but that that the office was equipped um, from the beginning with all of the resources it would need. But I, I do, I am optimistic. Very cool. That we will expand. What, uh, let's talk about transportation, public transportation for a bit yes. and your interaction with that. Uh, right. What are your recommendations for kind of generating the support to expand nighttime public transportation options? You know, we see the night tube in London before pandemic, and, and we know that a workforce here, uh, somebody gets out of the kitchen at 2 p.m., they got to drive home because and that means their car's on a highway. There's no really public option for them. We'll talk about a little bit about mm, advocating nighttime public trans transportation options um, that would be sustainable? Yeah. Well, there's two parts to it. Um, firstly, the fact that New York City has, let's say pre-pandemic right now, it's a little crippled, um, but it will be restored. The fact that New York City has one of the greatest 24 hour, uh, five borough transportation systems is the reason why we are the city that never sleeps. Right. It is the reason why we have a bolstering day and nighttime economy. It's the re one of the reasons why people come from all over the world to live and work here and go out here. Um, it helps with safety, it, to your point. It helps with um, mobility. It helps to, it is, it is literally the, the veins of blood that feed the economy throughout the whole city. We see when the, when the subway system was shut down here between, I think it was 1 a.m. and 6 a.m. Now I think it's two to four. I mean, it was a gasp. Like, like without, without a 24 hour subway and 24 hour buses, we're no longer a 24 hour city. It's just that simple. It's, 
a you know a plus b equals c it is it is essential to keeping the nighttime economy moving that includes the police and the doctors and uh, the restaurants workers and so it is not only worth investing in but it is essential to save and preserve but it's also interesting because you know, we created this one program early on. It was called the Lower East Side Quality of Life Improvement Plan. In the Lower East Side, right below the East Village, there's a six block radius, which one of the highest densities of bars, I think, I think it's probably second to Austin, <laughs> actually. <laughs> um, a lot of bars in very narrow, 25 foot wide streets, lots of residents, and what there were so many complaints. I mean, the amount of complaints were insane. And the tension and the enforcement and the, the difficulty to do business and the difficulty to live. And so I just took a look at this six block radius and I looked at what most cities do is they have all of these services like transportation, sanitation, parking, and they base it on a daytime life model. Yep. Right? And then all of a sudden it turns dark and life changes, but all the regulations stay the same. And now everything is like what it was flowing, now it's crashing. So we took a look at this six block radius and we said, why is there parking on both sides of the street on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night on a 25 foot wide street where there's taxis, Ubers, ambulances, police cars. If one car stops, it's horn honking all night long and it creates tension and the temperature rises and people screaming and it's just the whole balance. So we actually went to the police department. We went to the Department of Transportation. We went to the, the sanitation. Everyone's like, oh, it's filthy. Nightlife is the worst. It's not nightlife is the worst. It's the sanitation schedule sucks. Why is it picking up garbage at midnight when everything closes at four? And then they blame nightlife and say nightlife is destroying our neighborhood. No, it's your sanitation schedule. No, it's the fact that there's parking on both sides of the street. Right. So we took we actually one at a time got the goodwill of each agency went to the top and reformulated for that six blocks a nighttime transportation sanitation schedule to accommodate the reality of that neighborhood. Nice, nice. And that's the kind of thing that you can do in your position uh, being from the mayor's office of a uh, nightlife. Um, um, we're, we're about to wrap up here. I've got a couple of announcements I do want to make, but Ariel, yes. wonderful to have you. Thank you so much for, uh, for, uh, uh, being this missionary, uh, <laughs> to us here. Uh, Jose, thank you for also coming along. I saw you nodding. I see people kind of raising their hands and stuff or clapping or whatever. I can't, uh, I can't, uh, um, um, I can't tell you how much I appreciate this opportunity to hear and speak and speak with you and have you speak to uh, the folks that are trying to get this kind of same synergy going in the city of Dallas. Uh, I do want to share with everybody who's on this call a couple of upcoming things. Uh, on uh, next month on April 13th, it's a Tuesday, 4 p.m. We're going to be doing one of our Zoominars. It will be, uh, and these are free, open to anybody. This one's going to be, the topic is dark money, we're calling it, how cities are championing their nighttime economies. Two of the world's leaders in uh, um, uh, nighttime uh, policy and uh, nighttime programming, uh, Andre Inesayas, fr originally from Venezuela, who's now here in the States, and Alastair Turner from London, who's this little powerhouse, um, uh, are making events and making data happen that help, help us build our nighttime economies. Uh, that information is on our website. You can register now. In uh, May, on May 3rd, our, our seminar is going to be called Let's Eat. How restaurants should respond as nighttime diners return. We'll have one of the nation's leading consultants for restaurants, Matthew Mabel, as well as a senior editor for the nation's restaurant news, Ron Ruggles, a good friend, who will be um, um, our guest for that, talking about trends and the, um, things to watch out for. 
finally, I'm very excited about this on June 22nd. Uh, we're going to be uh, hosting uh, Dallas Police Chief, new Dallas Police Chief Eddie Garcia. Uh, we'll be talking about insights for safer, more sociable Dallas at night. And uh, um, our friends with uh, Safe Night LLC will be the uh, sponsors of that. We're very appreciative of, of everyone's attention. I do want to tell you one more thing. We're kicking the tires on a new idea for an outdoor nighttime event that would uh, tie into the mission of 24 Hour Dallas. If you've ever been to a night market in some of the great cities of the world, if that provides you then an idea of what we're exploring, some of you have already been invited to a brainstorm session we're going to have on uh, um, April 8th. But if you would like to roll up your sleeves and help us kind of kick the tires on the idea of a Dallas night market, um, let me know. Our next member meeting will be June 30th. Um, uh, Ariel just posted her email address and her Twitter handle uh, where we communicate often. Uh, again, thank you so much for being a part of this program, Ariel. And Jose, thank you for the two of you for your um, uh, superhero work. In, uh, in the New York City. So um, I'm appreciative of everybody who came on the call, especially our friends from across, across the ocean. Thank you for joining us. Um, and uh, that is today's 24-hour uh, membership meeting uh, with our very, very special guest. And let's see what we can do to make Dallas safer, more economically and culturally vibrant, and more um, racially inclusive at night. It needs to be. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Take care. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> Thank you so much. Bye-bye.